you know, it, it truly is uh, exciting to see what the Lord's doing in the life of our church. And, you know, I have to tell you, I was, I was um, really uh, thinking about how, how would it feel going to Africa and then coming back, you know, in the midst of, you know, launching this all-in building campaign. And I tell you, I, I stand before you guys now uh, two weeks, you know, removed from Africa, just more motivated, more committed, more on fire for what the Lord is doing because we see uh, what God is doing beyond these walls. You know, you've heard us say this before, and we'll, you'll hear me say this over and over again. The church is not uh, the building, right? The church is not the walls. It's not the brick. It's not the mortar. It's the people. And God is continuing to bless this church. God is continuing to, to lead people into this body. And, and it's an awesome thing, as we know that we've been called to be sent out. Uh, you're going to hear that phrase a lot. You know, I'm not sure who exactly coined it, but um, you know, it's the whole thing that it's not about a seeding capacity, it's about a sending capacity. And, and I believe that's what you find with the New Testament gospel. However, we know that as we enhance our seeding capacity, as God is leading new families, we enhance our sending uh, capacity. And so uh, we're launching this all-in campaign uh, this morning, and you're going to hear this for the next uh, four weeks. Not that you didn't notice right when you walked in the five big letters as you walked into Lobby A and then the, the five big letters here. And, and some people have asked me, they said, well, you know, why, why the gambling terminology? Well, let me clarify something very quickly. Uh, when we talked about all-in, my mind never went to Texas Hold'em. I'm just going to tell you that. Uh, my mind went to uh, a sports uh, motto. And, and specifically, uh, two years ago, if you remember, the Clemson University Tigers won the national championship. Any of y'all remember that? I remember that. They won it two years ago, and their, their year-long logo or their motto as a team was All In. Now, I'm not saying that's why we named it an All In, but I'm also not saying that it didn't play a huge role in that as well. And so, you know, we talk about All In, but what is that? It's, it's, it's saying that every member matters that every one of you matters, that regardless of where you're at in your faith journey, if you call this place home, and I know that there's many that I will talk to over these next three services that are still wrestling through that. You know, they're, they're still praying through, is this the place that God has called us to, to establish roots and to grow and to, and to lock arms with other believers? And hey, we understand that. But for those of us who call this place home, man, this is us saying, okay, we have a new starting line. You know, I think about 19 years ago when this church was planted. I walked in the doors of this church, as we talked about last Sunday, uh, really 10 years into the life of this church. And I walked into the doors of this church smelling the new paint on the wall. I remember when I was given the tour by the search committee. Uh, it was the week before uh, River Oak actually got into this, this uh, permanent facility. And I remember walking through just thinking, you know, thinking, man, you know, there's been years of sacrifice. There's been years of faithfulness. I wasn't a part of those years of setting up and taking down. I wasn't a part of those years of financially sacrificing for the Lord. But yet I'm reaping the benefits of it here 10 years later. And now here we are now 10 years from that, reaping the benefits of that faithfulness. And so it's a new starting line for us as a church, and we invite you to be a part of that. And so over these next four weeks, we're going to be talking about uh, an all-in campaign. And so today, if you've got your Bibles, I ask you to take it with me to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2. But we're going to go to some different places this morning. We're going to go to Revelation 2. We're also going to go to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, and then we're going to end up at Luke 12. And so I don't know how you can keep track of all of that. You don't necessarily have to. We'll figure it out as we go. But as you know, our mission statement, to live every day captivated and changed by Jesus, what is that speaking of? It's speaking of the fact that by grace we are saved. If you believe that, say amen. 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 We are saved by God's grace, and we should be captivated by that, not only just at the moment of salvation, but then as we walk with him each day, captivated by the fact that God would choose to love me that God would choose to indwell me, that God would choose to, 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 to walk with me and to talk with me, captivated by that, but changed by that. We know that we're saved by grace, but we're also changed by grace, that, that at salvation, God's grace is poured out upon us. But in the process of sanctification, Pastor Caleb did a wonderful job two weeks ago, uh, opening God's Word. He talked about kind of that, those steps of maturity. He's a little miracle. I know how illiterate he is. He's a little miracle up here. On the, I'm just kidding. I had to throw that out there, Pastor Caleb. I, never mind. I'm going to keep going. So he talked about those, those levels of spiritual maturity, that we should all be able to say, okay, am I growing, right? I mean, we talked about our, our, our measures as a staff. This is something that we've been praying a lot about is not only a mission statement, not only values, but measures. How do you gauge 
You know, we want to be able to gauge as we recognize the need for a pipeline here at River Oak, uh, not only just a leadership pipeline, but a pipeline for anybody walking in the door. That regardless of where they're at in their journey, to be able to say, okay, this is where you are, but now this is the next step. And this is the next step. And this is the next step. So how do we gauge those things? What are some of the measures uh, that we have in a growing relationship with Jesus? How do we know that we're being changed by Jesus every single day? And so there's some questions that we ask ourselves. And, and we kind of narrow them down to four things as a, as a staff. Am I following the Lord? Am I being changed by the Lord? Am I making disciples in the Lord? But am I living generously is one of the questions that we ask. Can you look upon my life and see that I am growing in my generosity? Not just when it comes to financial means, that's part of it, but when it comes to our talents and when it comes to our time, am I growing in the Lord? Can I go back and look at a benchmark in my relationship with the Lord that as I'm spending time daily in God's Word, as I'm spending time with other believers, as I'm spending time in prayer, do you see these markers of spiritual growth? And so what we're really talking about with this all-in campaign is discipleship. Now, I know that when it comes to the subject of money, some people can say, well, that's, that's all that churches talk about. That's all that preachers talk about. But if you've ever spent any time here, you know that that's not the case. And as a matter of fact, I've even got some baggage with that, that the Lord has to work out in my own life. Growing up in ministry, not in my father's ministry, but in other ministries, I was exposed to some things. That I remember sitting in the congregation asking myself, okay, is that really the Lord? Are we building an earthly kingdom here? Are we building God's kingdom here? However, I stand before you just as I shared last week and said my prayer in seminary is that I would be, have the privilege to serve a congregation that desires to hear God's word, that desires to hear the teachings of God's word. It's amazing when you start to go through the teachings of God's word, how much, deal, how much of it deals with the subject of money. And deals with possessions. For example, think about this. One out of every ten verses in the New Testament, in the Gospels, not the New Testament, in the four Gospels, one out of every ten verses deals with the subject of money and possessions. Think about this. Of the 38 parables that Jesus told, 16 of the 38 parables deal with the subject of how we view our possessions and money. Think about this. Roughly, if you go through and you start to count how many verses deal with these specific subjects, you'll find roughly about 500 verses dealing with the subject of prayer. You'll find about 500 verses dealing with the subject of of faith. You'll find about 2,000 verses dealing with the subject of money and possessions. We know that Jesus often spoke about how we view the things that we have. Well, why is that? Someone could look upon Jesus and say, well, all he, ta- all he talks about is money. All he talks about is wanting someone's money. No, Jesus understood that it's dealing with the heart. It's dealing with how we view the things that we have within our lives. I heard a pastor say this many years ago, and I believe it's very true. He said this. He said, a person cannot be right with God and be wrongly related to their possessions. There's a lot of truth to that. As we've talked about living every day captivated and changed by Jesus, we looked at that passage of Luke 9 that says what? He says, as the crowds were beginning to build, he stopped the crowds and basically said, okay, you want to follow me? Are you sure? And if you remember that verse there in verse 23, and we looked at it for a couple of weeks, what does he say? If anyone desires to come after me, let him what? Say it to me. Let him deny himself. Let him what? Take up his cross daily and follow me. I had someone ask me this question over these last couple of weeks. Pastor Heath, I desire to deny myself. Where's an area of my life that I can look specifically into and see whether or not if I have a heart that denies himself? And I tell you, when you look at the subject of money and possessions, it tells us a lot about how we view the things that we have. Do we honestly view them as everything being a gift from God? Or do we view it as, no, I've earned this, this is mine, and God just wants a little bit of it? Because again, it's the attitude of the heart. I remember sitting in a congregation just like this, and and a pastor standing up and basically saying this. He said, you show me someone's time with God, how much time they spend with the Lord. You show me someone's calendar, and you show me someone's checkbook, and I'll tell you what kind of walk they have with Jesus. And I remember sitting out there being gripped to the core. Because I checked boxes, man. I was at church every Sunday. I was there. I I would do my devotional every day. I was there. But when it came to letting go of the things that I held so dearly, it was a different story. 
And so hear what I'm saying as we begin this all-in campaign. This is centered upon discipleship. This is centered upon the gospel. Everything I'm going to talk about for the next four Sundays is the motivation behind it is grace. The motivation behind it is God's love towards us. The motivation behind it is what? To live every day captivated and changed by Jesus, recognizing that, hey, we're thankful that God's not fair because if God was fair, we'd all be spending eternity in hell. But rather, we serve a God who is gracious and merciful. And so why would we not, as we grow in our walk with the Lord, have this progressive releasing of the things of this earth? That's really a mark of spiritual maturity. It's as you grow closer to the Lord, it's this, it's, this, it's this increase of letting go, recognizing that, hey, I'm living for the things that are eternal, not just the things that are temporary. And so as we move into this four-week campaign, this all-in campaign, hear what I'm saying. This is not just about a building. Now, we want to build a building, and we believe that the Lord is leading us to build a building. But this is about making an eternal investment for the gospel. And so this is my challenge to you as, as we begin this campaign. Over these next four weeks, everything builds up to March 25th. March 25th is what we're calling a commitment Sunday. We're asking you to make a three-year commitment to a building campaign. But this is my challenge to you to not just approach this thing flippantly, to really seek the Lord in this. I, and I would encourage you to spend some time in Malachi. I would encourage you to go to the book of Malachi where God rebukes his people for basically bringing him the leftovers. And so this is my challenge to you, to not just do what makes sense, to not just do what fits within your budget, but to honestly, earnestly seek the Lord and to say, Lord, I want to be a part of something that goes beyond my, uh, my time here. I want to be a part of something that has eternal ramifications, not just the temporary. And it's interesting as you go through the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 10, it's the only time, it's the only time in Scripture that you will find where God says, test me. It's the only time in Scripture that you find that. And it's in direct reference to their resources. And so this is a spiritual journey, and I'm taking it with you. This is something that Amber and I are praying about as we look at, at, at where we are in our life and as we're praying about, Lord, what would you have us commit to these next three years? But this is a spiritual journey and in many ways a new starting line for us. If you think about it, many of us came within different windows of the life of this church. I came about halfway through the life of this church. Many of us, many of you came within the last year or two years or three years, four years. Maybe you came within that gap of the first 10 years. This is kind of a new starting line for all of us to say, okay, Lord, I want to be a part of something that, again, for my kids and for their kids, that they can look back upon and say, praise God for the sacrifices and the faithfulness of those who have come before us. Take a look at this timeline. This is in your campaign, but you'll see this kind of, uh, and we'll talk a lot about this. This gives you a little bit of the history of our church. 1990, it was the original vision of Mac Brunson, who was pastoring South Norfolk Baptist Church at the time. Uh, the Lord kind of put the brakes uh, until about 1999, uh, when 70 people stepped out of South Norfolk to plant this church, now known as River Oak. Uh, you can kind of see the progression there. They bought this property. Uh, 2006, it was their groundbreaking ceremony upon this property. For nine years, they met in high schools. Oscar Smith, then to Hickory High School, back to Oscar Smith. 2007, December of 2007, they actually got into the building. And so the original building was just this gym and that hall, not that hall, that hallway, lobby, lobby A, lobby A, and then that hallway was the original structure. I got here in March of 08, and it was about a year and a half later that we added then the next phase, which was this hallway, which we were able to bring our offices over and also develop some youth uh, facilities as well. And then in 2000, what, 2013, I remember us, where's Dan Cameron? He's sitting over here. I remember sitting in a building meeting in room 108, and the entire conversation was going to be about a worship center. And about 15 minutes within that meeting, we all looked at each other and said, God's not leading us to build a worship center. He's leading us to build a children's wing. And I remember walking away from that meeting going, you know, that, that's a rare thing to see. To see a group of men, to see a group of leaders who from the very beginning had dreamed of a worship center, of, of fulfilling the master plan of this property, but to put that on hold, recognizing that the Lord was leading us into a different direction. I remember how encouraged I was just walking out of that room going, you know what, Lord, when it's time for us to take this step, we will know. And I believe we know. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and stand with me in reverence to reading God's Word. Revelation 2, verse 19 
as Jesus is speaking to the church of Thyatira, listen to his words. And this is my prayer for us. This is my prayer for me. This is our prayer for our church. He looks upon them and listen to what he says. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 19, it says this. He says, I know your works. I know your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, now notice this last statement here in verse 19. The last are more than your first. Your translation may say, and that your latter works exceed your first. Man, what a testimony. Join with me as we go to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, that is our prayer. That, Lord, you are faithful to complete the work that you've begun in us. You are faithful to complete the work that you've begun in he- here at this church. But, Lord, these words right here are our prayer, that we would hear those words from our Savior. That, Lord, that, Lord we're growing in our faith. We're growing in our love. We're growing in grace. We're growing in our works. We're recognizing we're not saved by those things. We're saved by your grace alone, by your mercy alone. But, Lord, may it motivate us daily to increasingly let go of the things that are temporary and to invest in the things that are eternal. I thank you for those who have come before us. I thank you for the benefits that we experience today because of their faithfulness. And Lord, I pray now as a body that, Lord, you will stir in our hearts as we have this new starting line as a church to seek you, to be obedient to what you're calling us to do. Lord, may it all be for your glory. May everything that we do be for your glory. And Lord, at any moment, if we have stepped off of that path, Lord, we pray that you will close the doors that need to be closed. But Lord, may we walk reminded daily of why you've called us here to live every day captivated and changed by you. Lord, we give you praise for what you've done. We give you praise for what you're doing. We pray it in the precious name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. And so let me make a couple of statements again. Over these next four weeks, I'm going to be talking a lot about giving, but let me say again, understand the subject of giving is not about God's plan for paying the bills. The subject of giving is about God's plan for growing disciples. And so I pray that, pray that you hear my heart in this as we look at these next four weeks. Obviously, there's a task in front of us to build a building. But this is a spiritual journey that I believe the Lord is taking each and every one of us on. And it's this process of sanctification. It's an eternal mindset versus just an earthly mindset. I think about the words of Paul. I'm going to give you a couple of verses now. You can now go to 2 Corinthians if you got your Bible. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. But let me read for you what he says in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20. I'm going to read a couple of verses here. It says, final words to the church at Ephesus. We have the book of Ephesians, knowing that that's the letter he's written to this book, or, or the letter he's written to these believers. But listen to his words in the book of Acts, kind of his final statement to this precious body of believers. He says this in verse 24. I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And then if you jump down to verse 35, he says this. In everything, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself saying, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And that's kind of interesting there that the final statement that Paul would make to this body of believers of all the words that that come to his mind that Jesus spoke, that these would be the words that he spoke to them, that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Listen to his words now to the church of Corinth. You go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and look at verses 1 through 7. He gives us examples of this generosity, of generous living, of an eternal mindset versus an earthly mindset. As he speaks of the churches of Macedonia, we know that the three churches here that he's really given reference to are the church at Philippi, the church of Thessalonica, and the church of Berea. And listen to what he says here in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 7. He says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now listen to the statement he makes in verse 2. That in a great trial of affliction and deep poverty, I'll jump ahead and connect that part there, a great trial of affliction and deep poverty, the abundance of their joy abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, but beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering of the saints." 
and not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. And so we know this begins in the heart. This doesn't begin with the wall. It just begins in the heart. And when the Lord does the work in your heart, everything else follows. He says, at first they gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Now look at what he says in the next chapter. Go to 2 Corinthians 9 and look at the verses there beginning in verse 6. He says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity. For God loves, say it with me, a what? A, let's hear it again. God loves a what? And God is able to make all grace abound. Towards you that you having always, always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God. You see that again? Through the proof of this ministry, they what? They glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of this exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And so there's no question here what the motivation is. Over seven times in that chapter alone, he mentions the word grace. And he talks about, okay, what what is the motivation to live generously? What is the motivation to say, Lord, everything that I have is yours? Everything that you've given me is a direct connection to your goodness and to your faithfulness. Every good and perfect gift comes from where? It comes from above. What is the motivation? It's grace. This isn't a legalistic motivation. This is motivated by grace. Because when you truly understand who you are before God, you recognize, you know, I don't deserve any of this, that it's only by God's grace that he's given me life. It's only by God's grace that he's put the clothes on my back. It's only by God's grace that he's allowed me to live in the home that I live. It's only by God's grace that I have the resources that I have. And so the motivation is not a building. The motivation is not a stewardship campaign. The motivation is the grace of God. And Lord, just as you've poured out your grace upon me, I want to live in that grace. And I want to display that grace so that others may come to realize this indescribable gift. This indescribable gift that has no temporary means. This indescribable gift that is eternal. This indescribable gift that is found in the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for my father. I'm not thankful for some of the stories he shared last week, but I'm thankful for my father. In every service, he increased with those stories. By the 11:15, he was filling his oats. Let me just tell you that. And and so afterwards, he was like, "Man, you got a great church." I'm like, "Yeah, you got a little bit too comfortable up there, Dad." Okay, that's that ain't your pulpit. But anyway, now I'm I'm thankful for I'm thankful for my dad. This is something that that I'm thankful that as a young man, my 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 dad pounded this, and my brother and I. To give to the Lord, to tithes, to give to the Lord. And, and this is something that, again, I, I'm thankful for. At the time, I wasn't very thankful for. I remember being in middle school, and, and I wanted to go to basketball camp at, at North Carolina. After watching last night, I probably should have chose Duke's basketball camp. But anyway, <laughs> I wanted to go to basketball camp at North Carolina. And so I began to cut grass. And he said, if you want to go to basketball camp, he said, you got to raise 70% of it, and then I'll play the next 30%. And so I went all summer long, and I was cutting grass and cutting grass and cutting grass. And so I came to him very proud of the money that I earned. I had a whole stack, and I made sure it was in ones, too, it's a little, so it looked bigger than what it really was. And I said, Dad, look, 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 at what, look at what I've done. I remember him looking at me and going, well, well where's your tithe in that? And I said, Jesus didn't cut that grass. That's what I said to him. This is what I said to him. <laughs> You think I'm exaggerating. I, I'm not exaggerating. I said, Jesus was not out there cutting that grass. I was cutting that grass. And he said, hold on, hold on, hold on. And any time he would do this whole little thing and he, his glasses would drop down his nose, I'm like, here we go. Here comes a spiritual lesson. Here we go. See, I can talk now. He ain't here. He's at Kim's house. So let me say. 
He said, who provided you the lawnmower? And I said, well, y'all did. And he said, then how were we able to provide the lawnmower? I said, because you work. He said, well, how do, why do I work? What do I do? I'm like, you serve the Lord. He said, okay. He said, what about the gas in that lawnmower? And I said, Dad, I get it. He said, what about your health? He said, the fact that you're able to go out there and cut that grass, and you got two feet that you can walk around and cut that grass. And so after about 20 minutes, I'm like, all right, Dad, I get it. And by the time it was done, I was like, Jesus, just have all my money. All right? You can just have everything that I have. But, but I'm thankful for that. You know why? Because my dad saw the faithfulness of God early in his life. And he would tell story. Anytime I would start to complain about seminary, I would complain all the time because I'm driving on Mondays and I got to drive to, to, to Raleigh, North Carolina, three and a half hours dodging the cops in Emporia. And I got to get to North Carolina, in and, and which I didn't always dodge. And, 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 and I'd complain about, you know, I start class on Tuesday at eight in the morning. And I go all the way till 10 o'clock at night. And then on Wednesday, eight in the morning, I go to five in the evening and I got to drive home. And he would remind me, he said, hey, uh, Heath, I did that with a wife and two kids. My dad was pastoring in South Carolina, Lancaster, South Carolina, five hours away from Southeastern. And he was being paid $150 a week. That's what he was getting paid. We were staying in a trailer, in a double-wide trailer, right outside of Wake Forest, North Carolina. And so $150 a week, he would be paid on Fridays. And he would have enough money to put his wife and his two kids in the car, and they would travel five hours back and forth on Friday to church to preach. And then I remember this vividly still, uh, even now as a kid, on Sunday night, the, the, the with station wagon is what we had. We called it the Wonder Wagon because we wondered if we were going to make it in the station wagon, <laughs> like the ugly wood grain on the side, like it was awful. But anyway, he would have the station wagon packed up. I remember what a treat it was when we could realize that we could plug the TV and the cigarette lighter and actually watch some fuzzy uh, reruns of whatever on the way there. But he would drive with his family to Southeastern on Sunday evenings. And there were many of evenings that he would look at what he had in his wallet and go, I don't really know how we're going to make it there from gas or even with food. But then testimony after testimony after testimony, God would just show up. And God would prove his faithfulness. That whole Malachi 3, test me, test me. Do what I'm calling you to do. Be obedient to what I'm calling you to do. I will meet your needs. Now hear what I'm not saying. This is not a wealth and health prosperity gospel. That's not what I'm preaching. But I am preaching that God honors the faithfulness of his people. Now how those blessings play out in our lives, they may be on this side of eternity. They may be on the other side of eternity. But I'm thankful for many things. As I shared last week, of the upbringing that I've had, but this is something that my dad beat in us early on. Hey, regardless of what it is, you make sure that you're honoring the Lord with what he's blessed you with. I remember one of the first times we got a bonus and and I was was bragging about the bonus and my dad said, well, you're going to tithe on that bonus? And I said, well, there ain't nothing in scripture about tithing on on a bonus. He says, you want God to bless you? And so I stand before you this morning understanding that, you know, from a human standpoint, we've tainted this teaching. Because in a lot of ways, it has become a prideful thing, and it's become building an earthly kingdom rather than eternal kingdom. And I stand before you today preaching the words of Jesus, that it is more great to give than it is to receive, and God honors the faithfulness of his people. So this is what we're asking you to do. Put the next uh, slide up on there for our campaign. We're asking you to take a step. This all-in campaign simply means this, regardless of where you're at in your spiritual journey. There are some of you who call this place home, you're attending, but you're not giving. We're asking you to take a step. And we're asking you to pray about purpose in your heart, seek the Lord, and whatever the Lord leads you to give, we're asking you to take that step. There are some of you that are giving, but you're not giving consistently. We're asking you to take that step. There are some of you that are giving consistently, but you're not giving to a percentage. You're not giving to something that God has brought to clarification. It's just something of what do I have in my pocket? What do I have left over? So if that's where you are, we're asking you to take a step in this journey. There are some of you who you are giving a biblical tithe. And I know you can say, well, biblical tithe, Old Testament, New Testament. I stand before you to say, why would we give less under grace than we would under the law? There are some who say, yeah, uh, I give my tithe, but maybe the Lord's leading you to give more. And so regardless of where you're at in this journey, this is, again, discipleship. This is a spiritual journey for us as a body of believers. And the promise is there in Scripture. What does Paul say? He says, you will have God's blessings. Go back to 2 Corinthians 8 and just look at a couple of verses here in verse 6 and 7. 
He said, so we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. So there's a money-back guarantee here. There's a church in Texas that gave that to their congregation. They basically said, okay, we challenge you to give uh, according to what God lays upon your heart for the next year. And in the next year, if God does not honor and bless it, we guarantee you that we will return your money back. We'll make that, I'll make that same guarantee. That if God does not honor and bless you, that church in Texas will give you your money back. All right. I don't even know the name of that church, but we'll find out. I want you to see something very quickly. Go to Luke 12. I'm, I'm a little behind, but I want you to see the words of Jesus here. Now, I believe the reason Jesus spoke so much about money and possessions is because he knew the natural tendency of our hearts. That we can't serve two gods. And we have a tendency, if you're anything like me, a human being, it's easy to live for the things that you can only see. And to live for the things that you think you earn. And we see that Jesus addresses this issue all throughout the Gospels. And not because he needed our money. We serve a God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. But he desires our hearts. And so in Luke 12, the context of what's happening here, Jesus has been teaching about eternal things. He's been teaching about death. He's been teaching, teaching about resurrection. He's been teaching about the cross. And then notice this encounter that takes place in verse 13 of Luke 12. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So again, picture the scene here. Here's Jesus teaching on spiritual matters. Here's him teaching about the things that truly matter, the eternal things, the eternal things versus the temporary things. And in the midst of this teaching, this guy raises his hand and says, Hey, son of God, son of man, Jesus, Messiah, can you help my brother and I settle this financial disagreement? And Jesus never misses an opportunity to teach. And look at what he says here in verse 14. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness or greed, your translation may say, which literally means to thirst for more and more and more. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And now to drive home this point, look at what he says now continuing in verse 16. And he told them this parable, the ground of a rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns. I will build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whosoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Now the natural tendency of all of us is just what we can see. But the calling of Scripture upon our lives is to live for the things that go beyond just the temporary, the eternal. Look at what Jesus says now in verse 31. Jump ahead to verse 31. Listen, listen to the message he gives. He says, But seek the kingdom of God, and these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have, give alms, provide yourselves money bags, which not grow old. And then look at what he says. A treasure in heaven that does not fail. A treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. Verse 34, he says this, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What's the motivation behind all of this? It's the treasure that God has given us in our relationship with the Lord. And what we're asking you to do is to consider how God has blessed you, and then say, Lord, how can I be a blessing, not just to you, but to others in days to come? I saw this illustration. I'm going to end with this. I talked about a guy who woke up one morning and he picked up a newspaper, and to his surprise, it was dated six months ahead. And he was like six months ahead, and he started to go through and read articles that were six months ahead of where he was living. He started to read the sports page, and he saw who won everything, and of course, it was 
I was going to say the Patriots, Jack, but they didn't win this past year. But so, so they were reading, and he was reading all these sports teams that won different things. And, and he says, man, I can make money off this. If I have this knowledge, I can make money. He went to the financial section. He was reading all these things like, man, I can make money off this. With the right investments, I can make money off this. And then he turned to the back page of the paper. And he saw an obituary. And he saw his name in it. And all of a sudden, it changed. All that he thought he was going to live for in those next six months. What if we knew the exact day, right? The Bible tells us appointing the time to be born, appointing the time to die. And we knew that that was the window that God has given us here upon this earth. Would it change what we live for? Would it change the motivation of our lives? Would it change us gathering just earthly treasures or us saying, no, I want to store my treasures in heaven where a thief cannot touch it, where a moth cannot destroy. I want to set my eyes on the eternal things, the things that will last forever. Why would I just wrap my life around the things that's just a vapor, a vapor here upon this earth? But rather, Lord, by your grace, you've blessed me not only with your son, you've blessed me with forgiveness and and, and a relationship with you, but you've blessed me with so much more. May I not just hoard it for me. May it be a blessing to others. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Let me hear, let me say again, and let, you, let me, I want you to hear this again. What's the motivation behind all this? It's the gospel. Our salaries do not change based upon what we give to this commitment. The motivation behind this is the gospel. To know the Lord Jesus Christ and to make him known throughout the rest of this world. So I'm challenging you to just go before the Lord. I'm not going to ask you to do anything that God doesn't lead you to do, bottom line. Just to take what God's blessed you with before the Lord and say, Lord, okay, what am I doing with this? How am I giving this back to you? And if you call this place home, This is the door we're asking you to walk into because we believe that this is the thing that God is going to use for many years to come. When I'm long and gone, when you're long and gone, that whoever's here will be preaching the gospel, proclaiming the gospel. And may that motivation be what leads everything that is said and done. Listen, if you're here this morning, you don't know Christ is your Savior. That's why we're gathered. That's why we're here. Every service that we have, we want to give you an opportunity to respond. We've got leaders, we've got pastors that would want nothing more than to talk to you about this indescribable gift that God has given to us that we as sinners have a need for. That Christ came and lived the life that we could never live. He died the death that we could never die. And he rose again. He conquered the grave. He conquered sin. He conquered death. And he has promised now to take us from darkness, from death, and now into life. To breathe life in us to live for something more than just the hearing. We're going to stand. We're going to close in prayer. As I said, we've got our pastors, our leaders down front. Maybe you just want someone to pray with you. Maybe you say, man, I look at where I'm at. And I look at my current situation. And I don't know how I can do anything. We, hey, take it before the Lord. Whatever the Lord lays upon your heart, we're asking you to take this spiritual journey with us. Motivated by his grace. Stand with me if you would as we go to the Lord in prayer as we dismiss our time together. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost but now I'm found. Was blind but now we see. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, may that be the motivation of our lives daily. Saved by your grace but grown in your grace daily. Lord, may there be evidence in our lives, these benchmarks in our lives, that we are growing in our walk with you, that we are growing in our time with you, that we are increasingly releasing the things of this world to live for the things that are eternal. Thank you for that privilege. But you've prepared a place for us that we are so undeserving of. So may we walk out of this place, Lord, as we seek your face, as we seek your guidance. Give us ears to hear. Give us faith to take whatever step that may be, a step of generosity, a step of of generous living, whatever that step may be. For your honor and your glory, we pray it in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, 
Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon. We will see you next Sunday morning.